Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to your Crash Course in Formal Logic. In this section, we're actually going to do some truth tables. Now, I hope you've gotten the last lesson under your belt and you know your logical operators and how they work, all their truth functional definitions. Why do we need a truth table? Well, when I gave you the truth values of simple components, you were able to compute the truth value of the compound. It was actually very easy if I tell you that A is true, D is false, and E is false. Once you know the definitions of the wedge and horseshoe here, you can easily compute for the whole. And that's due to the one-to-one -one mapping function of our logical operators and how we define them truth functionally. However, when you're not given each and every one of these truth values, you need a systematic way to examine, and I have to emphasize this, every possible combination of truth and falsity for the simple component sentences, all the truth assignments that could be given to those individual letters. So here's how you're going to do a truth table. Number one, figure out how many rows from top to bottom you're going to need in the table. Those rows represent possibilities of combinations of true and false values for any given sentence letter and then find all the possible combinations of those truth values, T and F for the simple propositions, and under each one of those possible combinations, compute for the whole compound. That's essentially what a truth table is. So let's start with the first issue. How many rows do you need from top to bottom in your table? That is going to be how many possible combinations of truth value assignments are there given the number of simple sentences you're dealing with. The number of rows you're going to need from top to bottom is 2 to the nth power, where n is the number of simple propositions you're dealing with. Now you may be wondering why 2 specifically to the nth, and that's because you have two truth values. Uh, T and F, no in-betweens. Consequently, uh, 2 to the nth power is going to give you all the possible combinations of T's and F's for your compound sentence. Just take an example. How about a, uh, the number of rows for a two simple propositions in a compound? Like if we use this one, for example, A wedge to tilde B, horseshoes to B. Well, the answer is going to be there's four possible combinations because 2 to the second power is 4. So there's four possible combinations of truth values. Possibility one is that A is true and B is true. The second possibility is that A is true and B is false. The third possibility is that A is false and B is the true one. Or possibility four that they may both be false. But that's pretty well all your possibilities. Let's try another one. How about one, a compound with three simple sentence components? Well, two to the third power is equal to two times two times two, which is equal to eight. So you can see how this sort of thing uh, adds up. Or how about one with four simple sentence components? As you can guess, that's going to be 16. Now let's move on to the second step, exhausting all the possible truth value combinations underneath, uh, well, given all your simple propositions. Take the total number of rows you came up with from top to bottom on your table, cut it in half, make the first half uh, of the rows for the simple proposition true, the second half false. Let me give you an example. Suppose we're computing for the formula up, up in the upper right hand corner. Notice I took the number of rows in our truth tables underneath uh, the simple proposition letters to your left. I made half the rows true and half the rows false. This time I went two on, two off. Now after you've done that, for the next column you go by half of whatever you did before. Since we went by twos, I'm going to go by ones, or ins by, instead of by halves, by quarters. If there were another column for simple propositions, like if we had three simple uh, sentence variables, then I'd go by eighths, etc. So instead of going two on, two off, I go one on, one off, all the way down. And then I'm pretty much done in this table because I only have two simple propositional variables. Now we're ready for the tough stuff, computing for the compound that I had in, over in the upper right hand corner of the last slide. Use the rules from the previous section and remember, compute for only one connective at a time, one connective per column. Work your way on up to the whole proposition. Remember, if you take it things in baby steps, then you won't make mistakes. So to calculate for the truth of uh, the third column in the example, use tilde B and use the rules for the tilde that you know from the last lesson. So, for example, to work my way up to the whole compound, I need to first handle that tilde, then I can handle the wedge, and then finally I can handle that horseshoe. Go in natural order like you solved for other compounds in the last section exercises, and go one connective at a time per column up and down, and you won't make mistakes.
For example, I can just use column B to calculate the next column. The tilde flip-flops the truth values involved, so obviously I'm going to go put a true wherever there's a false and vice versa. Now I'm in a position to handle that wedge by using the two columns that I've outlined here in the purple. The only time the wedge is going to get a false is when you have two falsehoods assigned to it. And the only time that happens is in row number three. Now finally we get to the last column. I need to know where is there a row from left to right where the A wedge tilde B is true but the B is false. So far as I can tell that happens in two places. Notice, I do have some uh, things reversed here, but these two columns, number two and number four, uh, rather those two rows, are the only times where you get a true in the A wedge tilde B column and a falsehood in the B column. True antecedent, false consequent, that's how it works. And there's our finished truth table. All right, so what exactly have we proven with our truth table? Well, all statements fall in exactly one of the following groups. They're either going to be a tautology, and tautology means necessarily true. It's going to have straight trues down its column. Or uh, the compound statement may be self-contradictory. That is necessarily false. All Fs, that means all Fs under every possibility, every row underneath its column. Now, the contingent sentences are the ones where it could possibly be one way or possibly be the other. It all depends on what the value of the simple uh, compound or the simple uh, expressions are. Now, that, in that case, you have T's and F's underneath the column. So, every sentence will fall into exactly one of these categories. Into which category did the last sentence we analyzed fall? Well, look over to the far right and look up and down the column, and you'll find that the A wedge tilde B horseshoeing to B is a contingent sentence. Whether or not it's true or false depends upon what values are contingently assigned to the A's and B's involved. When you see that mixture of trues and falsities in a column, you see it know that a proposition, a compound proposition, is a contingent proposition. Let's take a look at a different one. I set up a truth table here, again, with just two simple sentence variables. Uh, and I've set us up to compute step by step the formula all the way in the upper right, just handling one variable at a time. So let's go to, ahead and handle the G horseshoeing to H column. Then we'll go ahead and handle the dot claim. And then we'll handle another horseshoe and build our way on up to the truth of the compound at the very end. Let's begin by using columns 1 and 2 to calculate column 3. Only place that I can see where you get a true antecedent and a false consequent is in row number 2. Now we're going to use two, these two rows in the purple to calculate the dot claim. What, uh, we only put trues in the yellow box when we find truth assigned to the uh, G horseshoeing to H and truth assigned to G. And again, that happens twice. And now finally, we're going to move on to calculate the horseshoe. In which places do you see that long ex uh, compound expression G horseshoe H dot G true where H turns out to be false? Do you see any? Not me. I haven't found one place where that turns out to be false. Consequently, we're going to have to say that that sentence that we just examined is a tautology. It is necessarily true. Virtu uh, true in virtue of its form and logical structure alone, not true in virtue of the uh, assignments of truth values to the simple parts. Now I've set you up a truth table once again with just two simple sentence letters. That means four rows from top to bottom. Uh, I've set you up here to calculate for the expression in the upper right hand box. That's a big one. Just take it step by step one operator at a time. So we start off with the tilde G column and that's just as easy as flip flopping the values given to G in each case instead of two on two off, two off, two on. Fine. We come to the tilde H column instead of of T, F, T, F all the way down, F, T, F, T. Now to calculate for the wedge, what we have to do is find the rows in which both disjuncts are false. And mark a false there. That only happens in the last row as far as I can tell. And then we're going to handle the uh, conjunction, the dot. The dot only gets a true when both conjuncts are true. Looks to me, looking up those uh, purple columns, 
and only happens one place, row 4. Now we're in a position to calculate for the triple bar. We'll just have to use these two columns that we calculated and try to find a place where both uh, sides of the triple bar turn out to have the same value, each side having either trues or each side having false. But, but it looks as though we never get that. They necessarily have opposite truth values. Consequently, we get Fs straight up and down the column. So what does that prove? That proves that we're dealing with a self-contradictory sentence. That sentence, compound sentence, is necessarily false. It has Fs under every possibility. That is Fs in every row in its column. Now, that's how you use uh, truth tables to analyze statements. But you can also compare two different statements to each other. The way to do that is to check them to see if they're logically equivalent. They may always have the same value. Maybe the two sentences are contradictory, always having the opposite value. Now, here's another way you can go about it. You can see if sentences are consistent versus inconsistent. That means, is there or is there not a possibility of both the sentences turning out to be true? These are two different approaches to uh, examining sentences and seeing how they relate to one another. But this time, you're looking at two propositions at a time. Now, if two sentences are logically equivalent, they're going to have the same values in each row. So, for example, uh, K implying L and tilde L implying tilde K. Actually, this uh, is an interesting form of contraposition, and it does yield logical equivalence. Let's prove it with the truth table. Now, notice I've set up your truth table here. It's very simple. There's only two simple sentence letters to deal with, so we're going to have four rows from top to bottom. And this time, we're going to build our way up to the two columns to the viewer's right. And once we build up to those, we'll take a look at how those columns compare to one another. First, to find out step by step uh, what each connective amounts to, let's start with the tildes. Instead of true, false, true, false, we get false, true, false, true. And for the k, well, we'll just flip values given to k earlier. Instead of two on and two off, two off, two on. Now, where do we find k implies l? It's only false in row two, where k was true and l was false. And what values do we get here? Well, can you find a row in which tilde L is true, but tilde K is false? Can find one, and it happens to be the exact same row as uh, in the previous uh, column. What did we find here? We found the exact same truth values in the blue on every single row. That means the two statements being compared are logically equivalent. They get the same results under every single possibility, every single possible truth assignment to the parts, simple parts, of the sentences. So what have we proven about the last two sentences? We've proven they are logically equivalent, always having the same truth value. And our truth table proved it. But we want to find an example of contradictory statements, those that have the opposite truth value necessarily. For example, how about k implies l, but how about when somebody says k is true and l is false? Now that seems like a straight up contradiction, right? So once again, conveniently enough, I've set up your table here for you, step by step, column by column, so we deal with one connective at a time and build up to the last two columns where the two statements being compared uh, are. So keeping things simple, let's go ahead and compute for tilde L. Instead of TFTF all the way down, FTFT. Then we need to find the value of K implies L. It only turns out false in row 2 because that's the only row where you get a truth assigned to K and a falsehood assigned to L. And finally, we can use these two columns in the purple to compute the co uh, conjunction of K dot tilde L. Only put a true there when you find truth assigned to both columns. And I only found that in row number 2. Now take a look at these two columns. Anywhere one has a T, the other has an F, and where the other has an F, the other has a T. They always have opposite truth values. And that proves that they are contradictory. They will always have the opposite values. They necessarily take opposite truth values. Now let's take a look at the second distinction with respect to comparing two sentences at a time, the consistent versus inconsistent distinction. It just boils down to one question. Is there or is there not at least one row where both statements turn out true? 
If the answer is yes, then the sentences are consistent. If there isn't at least one row, then they cannot be uh, uh, true at the same time. They're inconsistent. So let's take a look at this example, k wedge l and k dot l. Uh, set makes for a pretty easy truth table if you ask me. I'll compute very quickly for k wedge l. I'm only going to put a tr true there when at least one of the disjuncts is true. They both turn out false in row 4, so I put an F there. And how about for k dot l? Running my finger up and down the purple columns, I find that there's only going to be a true in row number 1, because that's the only time that k is true and l is true. So what does this prove? Well, as you can tell, in row number one, we have a possibility of both sentences turning out true at the same time. They both turn out true precisely when k is true and l is true. What's that enough to prove? Uh, even though the other three rows underneath, where one is true and the other false, or both are false, don't really prove what we want to, this one row at the top proves logical consistency. So that's an example in which two sentences are consistent. It is possible, that is, there is a row in which both are true at the same time. So let's try an example involving inconsistency. How about k triple bars to l and k is true but l is false? Now that seems like, given our definition of the triple bar, we ought to have a contradiction between these two sentences. Well, here's the table, taking it step by step until we can compare the two columns at the very end. First thing we want to do is handle that tilde so we don't skip steps. So we're just going to flip-flop the values under the L column. Instead of TFTF, we get FTFT. Next, we're going to get the triple bar column handled by taking a look at the column for K and the column for L. We only put true where they have the same values, like both true in row 1 and both true and or both false in row 4. Now finally we can handle the column for the conjunction. And we just need to run our fingers up and down two purple columns here and we find out that the conjunction turns out to be true just under one case. That's in row number 2. So what does this demonstrate? Well, can you find a row here in which they both sentences turn out to be true. You can find one where they both turn out to be false. That's row number three, but that's not what we're looking for. Can they both be true at the same time? So the answer to whether they're consistent or inconsistent is no. There's no possibility, that is, no row into which both statements turn out to be true. So two statements are inconsistent if and only if you cannot find that row or possibility. If you stop to think about it, there's a variety of relationships between the inconsistent-consistent relation and the equivalent-contradictory relations. Um, every pair of statements is going to be consistent or not. That seems pretty straightforward. But some consistent statements end up being logically equivalent to uh, one another. Uh, some are not. Some inconsistent statements uh, may be contradictory to one another, or they may be logically equivalent. For example, inconsistent statements could have Fs straight up and down each one of their columns. That'd be a case in which they were logically equivalent, and uh, yet nonetheless, they were not contradictory to one another because they didn't take opposite truth values. They had Fs straight all over the place. So oftentimes, pairs of statements are classified as equivalent or contradictory before they're being labeled as consistent and inconsistent. But it really is up to you as the uh, logician here. Well, that's about all for now. Thanks for uh, watching this and wait for my logic exercises. Now you know how to do basic truth tables and how to use them to analyze sentences and what types of sentences you're dealing with and how to compare two sentences to one another. In the next lesson, we're going to get down to uh, testing arguments with truth tables. And that's where the fun really gets rolling. So we'll see you next time. Take care.